The Hero's Journey, a Mindful Accord podcast, with your host, Rich Decker. Hello, and thank you for taking some of your valuable time to listen to the show. If you enjoy this show and have been inspired by this episode or another episode, I would encourage you to join our Patreon page. For those who are unfamiliar with Patreon, it's a platform that allows artists and content creators to build relationships with their audience, while at the same time earning enough money to keep providing the content. When you join our community, you will gain access to exclusive content such as live guest Q&As, behind the scenes, and other exclusive offers. And you can join for as little as $1 per month. There's a link in the show notes that'll take you directly to our page. My guest for this episode is Mark Stratton. Mark is the producer and host of the Think Spiritual podcast. This podcast examines a variety of topics related to the spiritual journey with an emphasis on the hero's journey. Mark is the son of a former evangelical minister in Canada. And during our conversation, Mark tells us of the challenges of being the quote-unquote preacher's son. He goes into great depth on his abyss stage in his journey, where he rejected his upbringing completely. He was mad at God and mad at the world. And he slipped into a deep depression, and thoughts of suicide were always present. It made me think of the author and preacher Rick Warren, whose son took his own life in 2014. Mark survived those dark years and returned with a vastly different worldview which led him to start the podcast and the YouTube channel. I greatly enjoyed our conversation, and it's something I've never really thought about until speaking with Mark is, you know, we see these preachers on TV, Joel Olston and all these others, Rick Warren, and and I'm sure you've encountered them at different stages in your life, but I've never really stopped to think is how are the people that are involved in this person's life, how do they feel? What are they going through? And we get some great insight into that. I think you'll greatly enjoy the wisdom that he shares. This is the hero's journey of Mark Stratton. Enjoy. Well, thank you, Mark. Thank you for joining us today on the Hero's Journey, a Mindful Accord podcast. I'm excited to hear your story and how you got to where you are and the journey that you've traveled on. But let's start at the beginning. Can you tell us about your childhood? Where'd you grow up? And tell us about your parents, your family. And then something I ask everyone that comes on the show is, what's one thing that your parents instilled in you, for better or worse, it's not always for the best, that you still carry with you today? I think that last part's a little tougher (laughs) than the rest of it. Uh, Thank you for having me on, Rich. I really appreciate it, actually. So, And I'm glad you've agreed to do mine as well once we're done this. (laughs) So, uh, It should be a fun day. Fun morning. Well, let's see. My childhood, I was a son of a pastor. And, well, I guess I still am. Well, he's not a pastor anymore, really. <laughs> he's a he's a chaplain in a prison now, and he enjoys that work far more. With uh, with churches, there's a lot of politics involved. I don't know if you've... Were you ever much of a church person, Rich? Or? I was raised Catholic. So, okay. uh, you know, not being involved, obviously, in a priesthood, I wouldn't know the politics, but I'm sure that there's plenty there, too. Yeah, I, I'm sure there's a lot of it, no matter – anytime there's a kind of an organization like that, I, I think there's a lot of that kind of politics involved or people not getting along, people fighting, things like that. So, I – I think I saw a lot. I don't know if I saw a lot of it, but I think I absorbed a lot of that as a child. My parents were very good people overall. I I had a very simple childhood, but I was really naive overall. And I I didn't observe things, but I I I feel like I just picked things up without understanding any of it. I kind of empathically just absorbed ideas and things like that. I don't know. If you say, if you say what my, what my parents instilled in me (laughs) that I carry with me today, I I would have to say the one thing that I stuck to, I know I'm kind of all over the place already, but (laughs) that's where I go. (laughs) The one thing that, that really stuck in my brain was something that my father told me once, because speaking of like all those church politics and such, he always told me to never 
pick up offense for him when people would talk about him, you know, behind his back and things like that. And if I ever heard any of that, he, he told me to make sure that it's like, don't get offended for me. Don't be mad at people just because they're mad at me or something like that. And I think that's something I have carried through with me through my entire life almost because I'm pretty damn hard to offend overall. <laughs> I, I can get mad. I can get upset, all those kind of things. But to actually be offended, to actually like be hurt on you know somebody else's behalf or things like that, it's that's a totally different thing. So I would say that's the one thing I carried forward that my father kind of instilled in me for sure. Now, that said, I didn't say much about my childhood there. We, as a pastor's son, I mean, we moved around a lot. I I basically have no, shall we say, roots. I was born in Newfoundland, which is the far east of Canada. Here we, but I was raised in Peterborough, Ontario. For, well, then that was only about seven years till uh, just about the age of seven. Then we moved to the far west kind of the northwest of Canada into Prince George, BC. And that was, uh, yeah, so I was seven there. We stayed there for, oh, how old was I? I think I was only, I think I was only 10 when we moved away from Prince George to a little town called Burns Lake, which was a little bit further north again and a little bit further west again. And we were there for, oh, that was probably another three years. And then down to down to Kelowna, BC, which was down in the uh, Okanagan, which is a very nice place to live for sure. Uh, but we didn't stay there long at all. That was only about a year. And this was, this was due to my father changing churches constantly. Uh, some, some pastors move around a lot and some stay in the same place forever. But yeah, we were not the, uh, we were not that type. So from there, we moved then to Sylvan Lake, Alberta which is probably where we stayed, where I personally stayed the longest, because that was basically, we didn't move there. We moved there when I was 14, I guess. Yeah, when I was 14, and I finally moved away from Sylvan Lake. My parents moved on. My parents moved on up to Peace River, Alberta, I think when I was 20, something like that. Uh, I stayed in Sylvan Lake, uh, not really by choice. I did move out to Burnaby, B.C., for a short time, for a year to go to, uh, I went to a small technical school there for a while and then moved back to Sylvan Lake because I didn't know what the, what the hell to do with myself. That was one thing about growing up in church is I didn't have uh, any experience in the, in the world per se at all. And I had no clue how the world operated. Like I said, I was really naive. I was an only child too. That's one thing I haven't mentioned. So it's <laughs> Right. So I have a couple of questions for you, if you Absolutely. don't mind. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Fill in because I know I get all over the place. So it's <laughs> moving around a lot as a child. How do you think that impacted you today? Yeah, I would say that's a that's a big impact overall, because like I said, I, I have no roots. I have no sense of, you know, quote unquote home. Even the house I live in now with my lady, Christine, this is the longest I've lived anywhere in my life. And we've been in this house for about five and a half years now. Uh, I counted it up a little while. When was it? I counted it up about a year ago and kind of posted it on Facebook because I thought it was kind of significant that I had lived in over 21 houses throughout my, uh, at the time, 42 years of existence. So that's, that's two years per house. That's that's not a long time to create any kind of roots or any kind of structure in your life, I don't think. So when you live uh, where you lived now for five years, do you feel restless, like you need to get up and move or something, like change? I think that's something I've had to learn to let go of a little bit, because yes, I, de I definitely felt that. But in my personal progression along this hero's journey, as you say, and I, I, I actually, I'm just going to sideline for a second here, Rich, and just say, I, I love that you do call your, your show, the hero, the hero's journey, because you totally get that this life is the hero's journey. And I, and I, a, a lot of people don't look at the hero's journey that way, but I know you're onto something there. So it's, so I like that you're, you're exploring that direction, but sorry, that's a, that's a bit of a sideline. But yes, in, in my hero's journey in learning 
I am having to learn to be okay with that restlessness and learn to actually, you know, kind of grow my own roots and, and be okay with, and, and it, it means that I'm, I'm really, I'm very okay with, with chaos and, and life getting upset and just, it's like, oh, okay, I have to move on. I have to move. All right. No problem. Whatever. But dealing with order and dealing with uh, stability, that's what I've had to learn to <laughs> learn to deal with. And it's actually, it can be difficult at times. Cause like you said, that restless feeling does come up sometimes. Well, you know, getting back to your, why, why we are both interested in the hero's journey. I, I'm just fascinated by the fact that this story, the hero's journey, is in every culture in yes. human history, uh, going back to cave paintings 40,000 years ago. So I yeah. don't know what it is about it. I guess I, I, I just, that's part of the mystery, but it's just, it's, I'm just fascinated by it. And, and, and we, most of us live that or, and if we don't realize it, you probably are living it and you might be having that journey many times in your life. So. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's why the hero's journey, that's why it's a, it's a cycle. It's a wheel, right? Or, or as a uh, Carol Pearson describes, she describes it as a spiral where you're constantly moving up the spiral as you, as you traverse the journey. But yeah, it's, you, you do, you travel, you take the journey over and over and over again. Every little step of your life is a new, is a new journey along the way. Yeah. It's fascinating. I, I, I have no idea why, but I love it. I love it. I love the idea of it. So can I get back to something about your, your father being a pastor? Absolutely. Yeah. Can you explain for those of us that aren't, uh, weren't raised in that environment the, the politics of a church oh i don't know if i could explain it well necessarily the denomination that we belong to is what's known as the paoc the pentecostal assemblies of canada which in the united states your equivalent would be the assemblies of god i believe the aog as for the politics of a church well a church is run much like a corporation in a sense there is a there is a board the head of, which is often the pastor, but not always. Uh, there's administration, and then you you know you have to deal with volunteers and people who how do you, you have to deal with people like everyday people who sometimes aren't that great of people though, even though they're Christians, right? Christ, Christianity does not always automatically <laughs> connote that people are necessarily nice or get along or anything like that. There's still people with variety of personalities and, shall we say, personality defects sometimes, too, <laughs> and that have all the same drives and same desires as people who are not Christians. Put them all into a building and put them all into a, shall we say, community, get them together a few times a week, and, well, I mean, you're going to end up with all the problems that happens within those, within those times. So board members or the church board often has to, you know, deal with those little personality conflicts and things like that. And also dealing with the money of the church and, and what their, what their goals are and what their, shall we say, mission statement is. And <laughs> so it's very much a, uh, and you see, especially nowadays, you see a lot of churches doing that, like where they get like these super fancy logos done up and they make sure they have a mission statement. And it's very much a business in that regard. And the business is to draw people in because the greater the numbers, the greater your church. That's the way it's, it's viewed overall. It's if, if your church is growing, you're successful. If it's not, then you're doing something wrong and the Lord is displeased with you or something like that. So I guess it comes down to ego. As always. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. No matter how your, asp how your aspirations are, ego is always present and tripping everybody up. Yeah, absolutely. Because like I said, if everything is going well, well, it means God is blessing you, right? That's, that's a big, you know, that, that's a big ego buffer. It makes you feel good and, and says, yeah, it's like, I'm on the right path. We're on the right path together. We're doing the right things because look how, look how God is blessing us and look how our church is growing and all this kind of stuff. Maybe some churches probably are say about money and things like that, but other churches are 
you know, the currency is the people, shall we say, in one sense, is how it's defined. Now, one thing I should say here, I'm, I'm, I'm painting, I'm not painting a good picture of my father here. I, I'm not painting a fair picture of my father because <laughs> the ministry and being on the, it stressed him out. I, I mean, had he stayed in it, I don't know. I don't know where, what kind of condition he would be in today had he stayed in it. He, he had to get away from it. Uh, my father is a very, he's, he's a person who cares deeply about people. And all he really cares about, he was never the fire and brimstone style preacher at, at all, ever. All he all he wanted was was to love people and to to help them and to you know get them through their days, get them through their weeks, even kind of thing. And that's why he enjoys being at the uh, at, at a, a prison chaplain now, much more so because he doesn't have to deal with that politics end, which he hated, which burned him out. And that's partly why he kept moving on from church to church to church, because it would just, things would just kind of, like I said, you get that many people together. It's just kind of a pressure cooker. And he, he just wanted to help people and give them messages of hope sort of thing. And, you know, not everybody in church wants that. Some people want the fire and brimstone. And so, yeah, he, he was not, he was, he was not a person that was actually cut out for the ministry in that regard. It was, it was too much for him. Uh, I think my mother helped him along the way, largely. My mother was a questioner and never took the specific road of the pastor's wife. She she wouldn't do the things that anybody expected. She she wouldn't be doing the children's ministry and the Sunday school and the putting on potlucks and doing the women's ministries and all that stuff. I mean, she did little bits of that here and there, but not to the extent that most pastor's wives are semi-expected to. Yeah, she was the questioner. She was the reader. She she kept my father sane, I think, for, for the most part, as much as was possible. But eventually, they both got to the point where they were just tired. They were just tired of it, and they had to just get away from the ministry altogether, basically. So my mother does not even attend church now. <laughs> well, so do you think that maybe part of the challenges during the, the that part of your life or his life or their life was the fact that she didn't play that role? Was that part of the politics of it, maybe? Uh, no, because because my mother is a very strong, very very strong person, and never let that part get to her. And dad let her be herself. I mean, did your dad? What well, well, I guess what I'm asking is, your did your father feel the effects of that? Oh, did he from feel his, the from, him, from from the 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 the, the parishioners? I guess you call them you, you in, know, in the church. You know, maybe in one or two places, maybe. But it wouldn't be for long, and and my mom was always the type to very much speak up for herself too. So it's so if anybody asked her or wanted, she would just be. I mean, her yes was yes, and her no was no. Right? Like she she wasn't the people pleaser type like my father is. So were you rate was it, since your father wasn't fired on brimstone, and your and your mother was a questioner and a reader. Were, you yeah. weren't raised in a strict environment, or were you? My environment was not strict. No, ex- except for you know a few things here and there. The thing is, is that I subconsciously, I believe, I subconsciously picked up on all this, and I believe that I picked up on what the church, what the church is, the members themselves wanted expected from me so i believe that i like i said i believe i subconsciously picked up on that and so i was the type of child who i mean i i I obeyed and and i believed everything too it's like i always thought it's like well i mean they're adults you know what they're talking about they wouldn't lie to me about any of this stuff so it must be all true then i knew what was expected of me more so by like i said more so by the people in the church than by my parents and so I never had a period of rebellion. I never did anything that I wasn't supposed to do. I mean, the occasional thing here and there or whatever. The the worst that my rebellion got is that I listened. I I made sure, when I got to be fourteen, fifteen, I started to listen to very hard rock music, but it was Christian music. <laughs> so, so. Oh, I didn't know that existed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, it, it does. It does exist, and that's the thing. I so my entire life, I've been sort of off to the side in one sense because I listen to music that nobody's ever heard of, and I still do that to this day because I listen to a lot of bands and things like that that nobody knows about. I I don't listen to Christian rock anymore, or anything. <laughs> I listen to a lot of the uh, European heavy metal. Like the the black metal and the and the darker stuff, uh, mostly the symphonic stuff. Bands like okay, Night, the bands like Nightwish and Delane and uh, 
and a variety of things. And but the Christian bands like Petra and Whiteheart and uh, White Cross, and I didn't listen to Striper because my dad was like adamant. It's like you're not listening to Striper. It's like okay, fine, <laughs> that's the one. But the the music was a thing he had a hard time with because to him he, he I should say I mean he grew up in a very strict environment back in Newfoundland. They're they're very very legalistic there in their thinking. So for him to actually allow me to listen to my hard rock Christian music, that was actually a big step for him overall. And he did it because he felt that it was helping me because I was having trouble socially in school. The school I went to in Sylvan Lake, it was a very strange thing. I went in about halfway through the year. I mean, everybody there had kind of grown up together. And here I'm this outsider. I was an outsider for the entire time uh, until graduation year, basically. And then graduation year, I, yeah, I was such an outsider. I literally had no friends when I went to school. I would, I would spend days, weeks where no one would even speak to me hardly. It was just, uh, and I was so, I was so locked up in myself and so struggling with my own, you know, you know how it is being a teenager and just not fitting in anywhere. I fit in at church at the at the church youth groups I was I was a totally different person so it's like I was I was two very different people all the time no matter where I went so that was your way of having some social connection was was in in the church yeah yeah just in and and it was just yeah it was the complete opposite because at church youth group I was sort of you know the top dog but then it, but everything wasn't like I wasn't a real person I didn't know who I was or what I was cuz I, I just had no, I had no understanding, like I said, of the world or what I was supposed to be doing. So it's like, I kind of, I feel like I, I feel like I hit the ages, you know, between 16 and 18, I feel like I hit those ages and I feel like I stuck there for, for a lot of years until much later in my life. Uh, maybe that's a totally different topic, but it's, <laughs> but I mean, we got to get that. That's, that's part of the journey. So it's, Sure. So is this, is it when you were 18, is this when you started saying, you know, this, this isn't working or no, nope, nope, when, when not did that happen? E- no, not, e- no, that didn't happen honestly until I was 32. <laughs> wow. Wow. So you were just, what, what, what were you doing for, you went to school, the technical school? What did you go to uh, I went study? To, I went to school briefly when I was 20, uh, for about a year. I, I took audio and, uh, audio and filmmaking a little bit for about a year. That was in Vancouver, and I probably should have stayed there ultimately. And, and I always said I should have walked on the set of the X Files because they were shooting the X Files there at that time. I, I always said I should have walked on the set of the X Files and just said, "Give me, a, give me a job, just give me something." And, I, and I, that's probably what I should have done. But I never did that. I was never that adventurous. And like I said, I had kind of no concept of how I was supposed to live or what I was supposed to do. You know, I thought God had all these big plans for me because, I mean, growing up in the evangelical church, too, that's what people tell you. All the time. You know, people pray over you and prophesy over you and tell you, God has great plans for you. You just have to blah, 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 blah. And it's, it's, that that's, that's a lot of pressure on a, on a young man who really has no clue who he is <laughs> for one, because then it's like every little misstep or something, you feel like you're an absolute abject failure, sort of how I felt in one sense. So. So I, I left Vancouver and I came back to Sylvan Lake, Alberta, because that was what was familiar. And then I could be in the church there, you know, and be important again, because it was, you know, part of the inner circle and all that. My parents had moved on, but I stayed at the same church and under a new pastor and everything. And when I was 24, then I ended up meeting this lady who was older than I was, and she had a couple of kids and, and I didn't know what to do with my life. And I thought, okay, well these people have been sort of put into my life. I guess I'm supposed to get married and, you know, live that life. It's, that was honestly sort of, I just thought it's like, well, I don't know what to do. So I guess I'll get married. That's what, that's what a young Christian man's supposed to do. Right. And that was an absolute abject disaster. <laughs> doing that. Mm. that was, uh, still to this day, I still wonder, it's like, why the hell did I do that? And why did nobody stop me? <laughs> Well, uh, I guess uh, it was part of the journey. <laughs> mm-hmm. It was part of the journey, and I and that's that's where I do have to look back and say, if if that hadn't happened, I would not be where I am today. Right. Now you talk about living in a uh, uh, in a strict household. Uh, that household with with my wife was a strict household. Uh, she was the absolute ruler of that household, and 
it was her way or the highway. And she was, she was very much that black and white evangelical. So I, I, I got more strict parenting from her than I ever got from my parents. <laughs> my, my parents never really, my parents always let me do whatever I kind of, you know, ever felt like doing sort of thing. But <laughs> so, <laughs> so you were almost like another child. Oh yeah. Way. Yeah. No, yeah. when, when, uh, when my step kids got to be, got to, into their teens, I was always really good at dealing with kids because I was a child myself sort of thing. Right. When they got into their teens, I didn't know how to relate to them anymore. And so it was like there were three teenagers in the house because I really, I honestly had not grown up. I really had not. I, I was honestly stuck mentally. I, I figure about 18, maybe even 16, but it's, my life was such a roller coaster ride. I was, I was honestly, I was displaying, I was having mild schizophrenic episodes where I felt like it's, I felt like I could talk to God in my head. Like I was hearing him in my head all the time. I was really manic depressive almost when it came to like my spirituality, especially I would go on these super spiritual highs and then just crash down into these lows where it's like nothing mattered. Nothing was, you know, as extremely nihilistic as a Christian overall, absolutely nothing matters. There's no point to anything. Why are we here? We're all just going to die and go to heaven anyway. So why don't we just die now and go? Yeah. I was extremely unhappy, extremely depressed. Yeah. The one bright spot when we finally had our, had our own child together, uh, I absolutely fell in love with that kid. Loved her more than anything in my life. (laughs) Yeah. But there, there, there came to, there came to a point where it's like, I was exceedingly suicidal. If anything, I was ready to either kill myself or my wife. If I'm going to be really honest about that. That was around the age of 32, and I realized just how bad I'd gotten and how – it's like when you're 32 and you feel like your life is over. Like, what is that? – like, that is, like, ridiculous to get to that point. And I feel like – I really feel like it was the religion that I was in that brought me to that point overall because I it was so ingrained in my head. And that's why I didn't leave my wife either because I felt like I couldn't, right? Like, divorce was, like, the absolute worst thing you could do sort of thing. It got to the point where, yeah, just everything was falling apart. It was, you know, I was having, I always had, uh, the one issue I had, I never had trouble with uh, drugs and alcohol, but uh, my one big issue was always uh, pornography. So, and that was something I was, I would say I was most likely heavily addicted to it, especially at the time throughout. And then, you know, my wife would find out about it. We'd have these big fights. It was all this big codependent circle of, awfulness (laughs) awfulness <laughs> just years of this and it's like why did i stay in that it's just i even i had a counselor ask me one time it's just like why did you stay in that it's like i didn't think i was allowed to leave you know so from you thought god would punish you or something it's not about god punishing me it was i was actually the biggest thing i was afraid of uh which maybe i should have mentioned earlier and uh, because it was also why i didn't rebel against my parents was the biggest thing I was afraid of was of disappointing people. I I could not stand the thought of disappointing people or disappointing God for whatever reason. And where that came in my mind, it it came in my mind when I was really young child somewhere. I don't know why I I had the thought way back. I think when I was five or something that it's like, I I can't be a problem for my parents. I can't be, you know, I, I can't let them down. I can't disappoint them. And like I said, I don't think that energy came from them. I think it came from the church itself and the expectations that a church puts on pastor's children, for instance, or any children in a church, really, like that are, say, of high-profile members or something like that. And that carried on throughout my entire life, yeah. What's a side I've never thought about is how does the church affect the people that run it, how does how are their children affected? I, something I, I'm sure I'm sure someone's written a book out there somewhere, oh, yeah. but I, I've never oh, yeah. I've never even heard of it. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, I mean, it's like uh, what was the guy that did the um, the purpose driven life? Uh, Rick. Oh, Warren? I don't remember his name, but I, I know. Yeah, I think it's was. Rick Warren. I know one of his kids committed suicide. So, oh, seriously? Uh, so, yeah. So it's you know it's it's something you don't think about. I guess it's. I, I don't I don't know how to understand it because I've never experienced that, but I, you're telling us here now, I guess. Yeah, uh, I, I, I mean, my story is not is not typical, but it's not untypical either. I don't think there is. Uh, 
at the age of 32, for whatever reason, well, there were a variety of reasons, and some of them I'm not going to go into here because they're way too personal, I think. And some of it's not even my story. Some of it is another person's story too. So it's, which (laughs) is not a good idea to tell other person's story either. (sighs) Some pretty not good things happened overall. And I got to the point where it's like, this is crazy. It's like, it's like, I'm a Christian. My life is supposed to be like, I'm supposed to be happy, right? That's, that's what, you know, that's what I keep hearing in churches is in churches. Everybody's saying you, you're, you're supposed to have the joy of Christ and all this. And it's like, I don't have that. It's like, why do I not have that? It's like, this doesn't make any sense. And I made a decision at the age of 32. And I said, I am going to stop praying and I'm going to go to a doctor. I'm going to see if there's anything wrong with me. And I'm going to go to, uh, I'm going to go get, get some mental health help too. I'm going to go to a counselor and talk to them. So I did that. I stopped praying, which was, you know, something I'd never done before. I was absolutely determined. It's just like, no, this isn't working. I keep going around in circles all the time. I have to break this cycle. I didn't put it in quite those words, but that's what exactly what I was doing. And I went to the doctor and, you know, I had some blood tests and all this. And the funny thing is the doctor was a Christian and I went back to him uh, and, and he just said, he says, you know, he says, your testosterone's a little bit low. He says, says I'm going to, he's like, I'm going to give you a prescription for some pills that'll kind of boost that up and get them, get your glands producing properly as they should be. And so that was a three month supply of a testosterone supplement that he gave me. I had also applied for counseling at the time. 10 days into my uh, testosterone treatment, I woke up one morning and I woke up and went, whoa, it's like, I'm not depressed right now. Because every morning I woke up depressed and just kind of feeling depleted and whatever. It's like, I woke up and I just said, I feel good. I'm not depressed. And I was like, okay, this is a wake up call, right? This is, this is somebody who prays constantly saying, God, help me, help me, fix me, fix me. And all of a sudden, medical technology jumps in and says, here, try this. And it works. And it's like, and I'm just like, whoa, what the hell's going on? It was at that, I think at that moment where the flares of my uh, anger (laughs) started to rise up (laughs) kind of thing, maybe partly due to the testosterone and partly due to just years of feeling like I'd all of a sudden, maybe I'd been lied to because that's a... uh, that, that's a big deal <laughs> when you suddenly wake up and go, has my life been an entire lie? Have I just wasted 18 years of it? 18 years from age 14. Yeah, but age 14 is when I started taking Christianity really seriously, shall we say. Let, let me ask you a question about that. So. Yeah. I'm assuming in, in, you know, I was raised Catholic and uh, I don't know how much you know about Catholicism, but it's, it's a lot of it's guilt, guilt driven. Oh yeah. <laughs> guilt driven. Yeah. So, so, and, so, is, so is the evangelical. Yep. Yeah. All right. God, God, God's the punisher in other words. Yeah. Yeah. It depends. I, I, I mean, there's, there's both views. That's a thing in, in evangelical. You get, you get, you get, God loves you. Jesus loves you and he's here to save you, but you know, don't screw up. <laughs> Right. Yeah, his dad. His dad's not so tolerant. <laughs> Jesus loves you, but his dad thinks you're a dick. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, what what I'm trying what, what what I'm getting at is that when you're raised in that environment, the power is outside you. It's somewhere else. Yes. It's up in the heavens. Yes. If maybe if you're raised in an environment where you have power within you. Perhaps you could have done something to fix yourself. You just, Perhaps. you just freaking nailed it there, Rich. That was, yeah, that was exactly it. Because when I took that moment and said, I am going to stop praying, I'm going to go see a doctor, I'm going to go see a counselor, that was me taking the power in my life for the first time ever, instead of always giving it up, giving it up, giving it up, giving it up. Cause that's, cause that's what I was told. And it's, it's just like, it's like you, you give up yourself for Christ. What I've learned now <laughs> at coming, coming down all the way now to this is like 12 years later from me taking those first steps. And now I'm realizing, oh, it's like, I didn't even have a self to give up to Christ. 
written, right? It's like, I, I never even developed myself. I actually had like, you know, no ego to protect me from the world and from others and from, from even myself, for instance. How can you give up yourself to Christ when you don't even have one? So you have to, you have to take that self-development. You have to take that hero's journey in order to develop yourself into a whole person. And then if you want to decide to give up that self for the work of Christ, then go ahead and do it. <laughs> but until that time, yeah, no, you, you have nothing of value to even give to Christ. So that that's my philosophy on that now. <laughs> that, that's a great, that's an interesting point. You should write a book. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's my idea. In the process, I, I think that's where my, uh, where my uh, my steps of the hero's journey uh, podcasts, I think they're going to be turned into a book by the time I'm done them. So it's it, it would be because I, 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 there must be books about people in like it, that you grew up in their experiences. But it, it would I think it would make a great book. I, I something I'd be interested in reading is is what what is your life like uh, or how did this happen? You know how did this affect you and what you learned from it. So, so you started taking the testosterone, and all of a sudden you're feeling better. Yeah, that was so. That what was happened just like from a, there? A plane ten days in, like I said. The outcome of that is that I uh, is ultimately that I kind of grew a backbone, and I started standing up to my wife, Ron, because she was always she's just that type. She just has to have things her way, right? Has to, and you know, uh, I don't want to paint her in too bad a light. It's it's not fair for me to do that. She had a pretty she and I shouldn't tell her story either. Uh, she didn't have a great life growing up or anything like that. But at the same time, it's, yeah, it, I mean, we should have never been together, but had it not been for her, I would not be where I am today either. <laughs> so it's, right. Right. So, I mean, the, good with I, the bad and the bad with the good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I had to learn those lessons, right. And I had to learn the hard way. You know, I, I like I said, I didn't really get that growing up because my parents just kind of let me do, you know, whatever. And I never, I never pushed too hard against them. So it was, so, so I didn't really grow a lot, shall we say under my parents in one sense, but I had to do a whole lot of growing up all of a sudden on my own. So when I started taking the testosterone, that was March, 2007. Then there was this real internal struggle and going to, so I went to the counselor too. And one of the first things the counselor told me after I told him kind of my backstory and things like that, and my counselor was a really, really important phase, more important than the testosterone, really, in one sense, because the testosterone was just three months to kind of boost my system. And really, like I said, it sort of like gave me the backbone, gave me, it, it's kind of set the fires of my anger going because my anger was a tool to to get me where I needed to be. And eventually I had to learn to let that go too, because you can't, uh, anger is a great tool, but it, it will, it will eat you too, for that matter, if you stay in it for too long. <laughs> and I was getting to that point, uh, much later on, but, uh, I know I'm all over the place, but <laughs> that's the problem with looking back over <laughs> things. Well, it's a, it's a long period to, to, to examine, but so, yeah. so you find you, you, you confronted your wife. Is that when you decided to end your marriage or yeah, not, not so much confronted. Uh, uh, I'll come back to that in a second. Cause I just, uh, I wanted to talk about my counselor for a second there and, Oh, sure. Please. And just, so your counselor was kind of a mentor for you in, in many ways. Oh yeah. 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 You talk about the, uh, the hero's journey meeting with the mentor. Yes. Like he is absolutely. And one of the first things he told me, and I, th I think it was our first session. And th this is the weird thing too. It's like, because I was still a Christian at the time, I went to a Christian counselor and now this is a Christian counselor. And what he tells me is that after I tell him all my story, so what he tells me is that Mark, he says, I cannot help you with your spiritual problems. Okay. <laughs> this is the first time anybody's ever told me that, right? Even pastors won't say something like that. They won't say, I can't help you. It's like, well, isn't that your job? Aren't you here to help me with my spiritual problems? <laughs> so this counselor says, I can't help you with your spiritual problems. So he's saying, that's something that I have to work out over time. He says, but he says, I can help you break out of these cycles of behavior. He says, I can help you to learn to deal with your emotions. Cause that was one thing I'd never, ever learned to do. I basically almost didn't have emotions at this point. Like I was so repressed and everything was so shoved down. So that was a thing, like having these first fires of anger start to burn were like, 
like this, they could have burned easily out of control and they probably did for a while. So him telling me that I was instantly like, whoa, okay, well, you know, where is this going? I'll probably come back to that because there was a point where I stopped going to counseling for a bit. And then I went back to that counselor. I'll come back to that because that doesn't make sense otherwise. (laughs) (laughs) No, there was a period. So that was, that was in March, April, 2007. And by July, 2007, I mean, the fires of anger were just, they were raging out of control. Basically there was just one Sunday morning where we're, getting ready for church and i was just long sequence of events but i just basically got to the point where it's like i told my wife i just said it's like i don't believe anymore i do not believe in it's like i don't believe any of this anymore it's all a pack of lies it's all anyway big fight blah 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 blah. and ultimately she told me that i needed to find my own place to live finally and and i and the crazy thing was is that i needed for her to say that to me Cause I don't think I could have, I don't think I could have left on my own. I, there was just this thing about her releasing me and telling me to go was like, yeah, okay, time to go. That was just like the kind of hold and power she had on my life. Right. And it's just it, entirely mental, entirely psychological, but it's, uh, it was just, it was just the way I was and the way I was. And so I did that and I started my life on my own at the, I mean, I turned 33 right at uh, just, a you know, a month later, that was the beginning of my true hero journey. And I had, I had to grow up basically. So I've, I've always said, it's like, I was sort of stuck at the age of 18 mentally. So I, I actually probably aged like uh, 20 years within the period of probably about five or six. <laughs> so so it, then, then did you, did you abandon the church and Christianity I, at that point? I absolutely, ab- yeah, I absolutely let it, I, I just said, I'm not believing this anymore, uh, with a, a, a lot more harsher language than that. <laughs> right. Anger, anger. Yeah. 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 No, there yeah. was, there was a lot of, like, I mean, it was burning full tilt. Like I, I was, I was absolutely furious at the way my life had turned out and just, I mean, it was fuel for me too, but eventually I was so angry. Uh, I stopped going to counseling for a while and I just, and I was living my life as I wanted. I was actually, I was, so I had my first beer at the age of 33 when I went out. <laughs> I, like I'd, really? I'd never wow. drank before. I would like none of that. Uh, the first time I went to a bar and I, I sort of sat near the back and I was learning to socialize with people and I, but I, I sat near the back and I just watched everybody and I watched everything. And I had one beer, one beer for the night. And that was the first time. And I, and I nursed it the whole night and I just, I sat and I watched and I, and there was a band playing and there were people dancing and all this. And I was just like, this is just like church. I said, it's no different. <laughs> That's interesting. How, how so? It, it was just, it, it was, it was people doing the same. It was people talking and communing and you know dancing to a band there's always the worship team the worship service things like that i was just like it's exactly like church they're just worshiping different things it's like i, I at the time I, I don't know you know what they were worshiping necessarily i think they were just you know having fun you know just kind of worshiping life itself sort of thing but yeah that was the that was my initial impression of being in a bar and uh being out drinking and just having a good time and things like that. And I, and I began to see the point in it and, and actually, uh, and for quite a while I, I did, uh, I did kind of go on a, shall we say a binge. Uh, It wasn't a binge necessarily, but it was, but definitely where I was partying and drinking and, and, but for me, it was always fun. Like I actually, I, I started to make like good friends and things like that. I never really had close friends or anything through any of my adult life, hardly. And so I started to make some and, and there was a while there where I was going out and drinking a lot. And one of my, a couple of my friends actually like had an intervention for me and they're just like, are you okay? It's like, you're drinking an awful lot and you're partying an awful lot. And I was like, yeah, it's like, I'm doing it consciously. I want to, I said, cause I've never done this before. <laughs> and they're like, right. You didn't do, you didn't go through that phase that most 16 year olds go through, right? Where they no, have no, fun. I didn't, and yeah. Rebel. I didn't have that. So this was my teenage rebellion. Is what it was yeah. at the at the age of thirty three, thirty four, I guess even thirty five, I guess to some extent. 
Uh, I, I don't drink that much now, hardly at all, but I have to say when I, when I do, it's like, I, I'm, it's kind of weird. It's like, I, I actually enjoy being drunk. I enjoy being drunk when I'm in a good mood. Uh, alcohol is one of those things that it just, it, it just expands the mood that you're currently in. So if you drink when you're mad, you're just going to get madder. And if you drink when you're in a good mood, then you're going to be in a really good mood. <laughs> Yeah. And I always yeah. enjoyed that feeling and being in a room full of people that were, that were all in that, in that sort of same mood. I think it's a great feeling when you can control it and do it consciously. So during this phase, when you abandoned the church, were you, what was your beliefs about uh, God or a higher power, things like now that? that? Well, for a while I went completely atheistic. Uh, you know, uh, our human tendency is to swing from one extreme to the other. I did that as well. And uh, but then the, but the anger of it, like I said, it really started to control me. It r- really started to just get to be too much. And that was when, uh, I'd stopped going to my counselor and I went back to him and this was, and this, he was still like, he's a Christian, right? And this is a Christian counseling area and they're helping me not be a Christian. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I always love the irony of it. And, but I mean, he was what I needed though, too. And he was, he was right there with me along the way and he never judged me. He never, and that was, that was why I went back to him. He, uh, I trusted him implicitly with everything I said and, uh, sorry, a little emotional. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right, man. Let it, let it flow. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what, that's what I had to learn too. Right. So yeah. I went back to him cause I was so angry, so upset, so I, I literally, I literally wanted to burn down every church I saw. That's how angry I was. I ended up going to uh, uh, anger management <laughs> through this uh, through this counseling center, and we were, we used the. <laughs> I think partly due to me, they they kind of catered to me a fair bit because I was the only one in the group who was not a Christian and like adamantly not a Christian. They would open their meetings with uh, with prayer. And my counselor told me, he's just like, he's like, you're, he's like, you're welcome to join us. He says, or if you need to, he's like, if you need to leave while we do this, he's like, please do so. And I would just stay there with my eyes open and just listen. And just, it's kind of in my head, just be like fucking idiots. <laughs> like just <laughs> You misguided fools. Yeah. Yeah. But, but they, but they let me though too, which I highly appreciate. And they, I think they, they use the book anger management for dummies. <laughs> Oh, really? <laughs> rather <laughs> rather than some Christian-based one or something like that. Huh. Th- that's the thing. I, f- I feel like they were, they were actually listening to me, for one, and I feel like we learned from each other. And I think my counselor didn't say that in so many words to me, but I feel like that I taught them things, too. So it was like about sort of the nature of counseling and the nature of, uh, the nature of shall we say, counseling people who were Christians or, or struggling with their faith and things like that, too. But anyway, that anger management for for dummies book, uh, I ended up reading most of it, and it there was one particular sh- section that really jumped out at me, and it said uh, I don't remember the exact words, but it says in order to in order to work through your anger, it, it says you had to you have to feel your pain, and I was in a lot of pain, a lot of pain. And so there was literally a night after reading that, I realized, oh my God, that's true. And I sat on my couch one night and I sort of, I sort of took this pose of like surrender. Do you know what I mean when I say that? Oh, sure. Completely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, This physical pose of surrender. I sort of took sitting there on my couch and I said, okay, it's like, I'm going to feel my pain. Yeah. And I, it worked. (laughs) I worked through it. I, I, I broke my anger and it's not, you know, I, I broke that, that raging anger that would eat you alive if you let it. Through just surrender? Through the surrender, through fe- actually feeling the pain and actually admitting it's like, yeah, it's like I'm in pain and this is why I hurt and this is why, and this is why I'm so angry because I'm holding on to this pain and I'm not letting go of it and I'm not, I'm not moving on from it. So, cause pain, pain will keep you stuck. And then it, it, when it, when it sits there and festers, it turns to anger. And that's how you let you lash out at everything around you, even things that are trying to help you. 
can I ask you, did your parents know that this was going on? Did you relay oh, yeah. any of this to your parents? Oh, they yeah. Did? Now, yeah. Did, did, did they feel responsible? Uh, when I first le- left my wife, I actually sent them a letter and I was fully prepared to actually cut all ties to my parents if I had to. Uh, I, I had said to them in a letter, it's like, look, it's like, this is the way it's like, I do not believe anymore. I have to make my own, my life is mine. It's not anybody else's. I have to make my own choices, make my own mistakes. I have to learn that it's okay. They're not okay, or well, it is okay, that, that I'm going to disappoint people no matter what happens. And it's, like, I said, it's like, if if you're not okay with this, I have to say goodbye. I can't be around you right now. And we, we can't be part of each other's lives. And their message back was, uh, we just want you to be happy. Because they had seen that I wasn't happy for a long time. And and they struggled too with it. We we all struggled. It was all it it was a healing process for our family because I don't think I don't think we'd ever been, you know, really deeply emotional or deeply involved with each other. And now I, I have this relationship with my parents now where we're pretty much entirely honest with each other. My relationship with my parents is not child to parent, it's adult to adult. And it was it was largely largely due to me saying I am going my own way and I'm, I'm not, I'm not hiding things and I'm not, I'm not just going to live my life trying to please people or anything like that. So what are your beliefs now as far as God and religion and all this? Uh, I mean, that's been all over the place, I guess. And, but it's, it's highly flexible. <laughs> now, shall we say, I take a little bit from every religion that I find I- anything that anything to me that rings true is true. But I should mention that the, uh, the hero's journey has been there for me all along the way, because when I was in that struggle, those few months where I was on that testosterone boost and really struggling with my faith, guess who I see a special about <laughs> It's Joseph Campbell. Oh, Joseph Campbell. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was, so you was sun- immediately related to that? Well, it was a Sunday. I was sitting there and I was begging God for some sort of word or some sort of. So I was watching all these Christian evangelical shows and just, it was just absolute drivel and nonsense and just all the same stuff I'd heard. Every single Christians would tell me afterwards, it's like, oh, you just didn't believe the right things. It's just like, and I'm just like, I know more about the Bible and more about Christianity than you do. It's like, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like, and I believed it. I believed it hard, 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 hard. But so watching all those evangelical shows one, one morning, and I was just, I was just getting madder and madder and madder and madder watching it. And then I flipped the channel and here's, Joseph Campbell and Bill Moyers with the Power of Myth series. I, I don't remember what I got out of it, but I remember the feeling that I had of just like, just being, it's like, this makes way more sense than any of this other Christian drivel I've heard all morning or throughout my entire life. It was just, and something, something about the man too, it was just absolutely captured me. And, uh, I mean, still to this day, I don't know that much about Joseph Campbell as a person per se, <laughs> uh, but, but his message of the hero's journey and finding your bliss has, has clung to me the whole time throughout this last, you know, 12 years. So do you think God answered your prayer? <sighs> the prayer that God answered was when I prayed way back when I was 15 and maybe, have, <laughs> maybe I should regret ever praying it. But I, but I had, uh, I asked God one time to show me what it was like to not be a Christian because I had no, uh, no concept of what it was, what it was like to, to not be a Christian. And so he showed me (laughs) what it was to not be a Christian. And in doing so, while I do not claim to be a Christian, I will guarantee you that I am a better Christian today than I was throughout all my years of Christianity. (laughs) So what, what is your belief on on God and, and and all that. I mean, do you believe there's a something uh, higher? Or? If I'm going to be bluntly honest, I believe we are God, and that the the hero's journey is the way to unleashing that, or the way the Buddha or whatever religion you do want to follow that actually makes you take personal accountability and personal responsibility for your life. So, do you think we go somewhere when we die? Uh, 
I like to think so, but uh, I'm I'm actually more partial to reincarnation, actually, probably than an actual afterlife. But but I mean, there there could be something I don't know. I, I like to look at the idea that maybe God is not big and out there; He is exceedingly small and in everything. That's an interesting point. Now, how do how do your parents feel about your beliefs now? Oh, there we have great conversations. All of like talking about all this stuff. We're, we we explore now as you know as a family, rather than just saying that this is the way and that's it. My father has you know a little bit harder time with that than say my mother and I do. My mother and I we can, we can we can talk and we just go deep and just all kinds of. But my father, yeah, he he, he struggles sometimes. But I mean he, I mean he eventually gets there, sort of thing, you know. It's, uh, he, he's, he's open basically to, but I mean, he still firmly believes that, you know, Jesus Christ is the son of God and I believe in heaven and all that kind of thing. I think so. So do you think that Jesus was an actual living human being? You know, I am partial to believing that he actually was, but my thought is that he's, he was actually a, uh, uh, definitely more of just an enlightened being like, uh, like uh, like the Buddha, and that uh, that he woke up in Palestine one day and went, "Oh crap!" <laughs> He's like, "What am I doing?" <laughs> I see. So, so you have your own podcast, and you yes, have I a do. web page, and you do other things with it. What led you to start the Think Spiritual podcast? You know, in one sense, I have no idea. In one sense, but it was it was a long succession of attempting different things. I'd always wanted to do, I, I don't, I've always wanted to have like a successful YouTube channel. And I mean, I'm not there yet by any means, but the, just that, that idea is fascinating to me. And, and with me, I, I don't want to just talk about just anything or I always want something to have a purpose, have a point, have, you know, some depth, have some meaning, but it's not, it's not easy to do. It's not easy to find, find your voice in your audience. So, I mean, this has been a lot of experimentation and a lot of trying to figure out who I am and what my voice is. And I had a lot of help along the way. I, I have a good friend that he started a podcast and I produced his podcast for a few years. And then I decided that it's like, no, it's like, I need to, I need to do my own thing. Cause I was getting tired of doing it just, you know, every week and that kind of thing and talked about it. And so I kind of went off on my own way and I've played music in a band too. And I thought, Oh, maybe this is the way. And yeah, cause I started a YouTube channel for that band and was doing all kinds of hard work for it. And then the band broke up and <laughs> it's just like, so everything I tried to do, it seemed like it just eventually kind of fell apart, but it was all leading me. I don't know what it was that all of a sudden I don't. I I have this di very different way of looking at movies and films and, and my interpretation of them and the emotional content that I see even in movies that people would be like, oh, there's nothing there to value or anything like that. And I'm just like, nope, there is. And so, so I would especially explain things to my lady Christine sometimes the way I saw them, and I don't know. And she told me one day she's just like she's like you're so good at that. She's like she's like why don't you do like a She's like, why don't you do a video about talking about one of those or something? I was just like, oh, hmm, interesting. And so I tried that kind of on my personal YouTube channel at first. And then I all of a sudden had the thought, it's like, why don't I turn this into a podcast? And that's, and then it's like, well, what do I call it? I don't know. And so I called it Think Spiritual at the time because I was also talking about just like enlightenment and awakening and things like that. And maybe in hindsight, I don't know, uh, we always maybe the word spiritual isn't the best word to have in there. Maybe it scares people off. I don't know. And then I just, I decided that I wanted to do a series on the hero's journey because I wanted to understand it better myself. And basically the entire podcast is now my entire focus has become on the hero's journey now <laughs> instead of, uh, instead of just sort of this hodgepodge of spirituality. Are you following your bliss then? I think I may have finally found it. <laughs> It took me a long time to find it, but I think this might be it. If I could spend the rest of my life talking about the hero's journey and helping others to along their own hero's journey, if I could start taking, I'm taking my first steps into my, into my mentor's journey now. So it's <laughs> How's that? 
in February, I have booked uh, an auditorium space and I'm actually doing a live presentation on the hero's journey. So, so this will be my first attempt at, shall we say, teaching it. That's awesome. Fantastic. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it's, I, I know you've done some presentation stuff, I think. So maybe at some point I'll have to pick your brain about some tips and tricks. Sure. And, stuff. And, and- and what I would suggest to you too, and I suggest this to everybody, I, I, I'm assuming there's Toastmasters up there. I, I'm not sure what that is. It's an organization that was formed about a hundred years ago oh. to help people learn to be better speakers, public speakers. Oh, okay. So I would strongly suggest you look at if there's any Toastmasters group or anything similar and join that to help you to become a better uh, public speaker. I am uh, t- Toastmasters is uh, Toastmasters is awesome because almost everybody living on the planet it, the, the one of the greatest fears is speaking in front of other people, right? Yeah, I don't I don't have that problem. So <laughs> Oh, you don't. Okay. Well, well, well okay, well, you're, I, I should, you're the exception. <laughs> I don't I don't have the fear of it, uh but whether I actually do a good job you, you've seen even as I'm talking here I can rabbit trail and be all over the place. So my my right, issue is staying right. on point. <laughs> <laughs> right. And that will help you. But, okay. b- but for most people, speaking in front of other people is, is, an ex- is a big fear. Yes. So when you start overcoming that fear by going to Toastmasters and speaking in front of people, right. it trickles right. into other areas of your life. Okay. And it's, it has a huge impact on your life. Gotcha. So I, I suggest to everybody, even the, those that don't want to speak in front of other people, because it's exercising a part of yourself that most of us are afraid of. Yes. So what's the mission of, of Think Spiritual? What's your mission right now? Oh, I don't know if I could clearly define. Well, actually, no, that's not true. As I was figuring out what this presentation was going to be, I would say that the true mission and my true desire and what I want to say to is be your own hero and do the internal work, change yourself change your world is my tagline for the, (laughs) so you do that internal work, you, you change yourself, you become your best self and your world is going to change for the better, your, your world around you. And then if, if you are the, the type of person who absolutely is supposed to, if your mission then is supposed to go out and change the physical world, then you do that. But don't try changing the physical world if you haven't done the internal work. Because that's going to be a disaster. Oh, what is it? Carl Jung said, um, "Perception or inter- perception or interpretation is perception, or something like that." Basically, saying that that you know the the world around you is is just a representation of yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and that's that's what a lot of uh, I keep hearing that a lot now. That uh, isn't that similar to we create our reality? Is that sure? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I that keeps coming up a lot for me now. I uh, keep hearing it here and there, and I've, uh, it, it's something that I'm not sure if I ever believed it, but when I start seeing certain things actually working, uh, for instance, for this presentation, I, I said, it's like, okay, it's like, I need, you know, I said, I need $500 to put this presentation on at, at least that amount. And within a week, I had 500 extra dollars. Like just, just from, uh, uh, I, I sell music gear and stuff online too, but you know, sometimes sales are sporadic and not very good sometimes, but I just decided, okay, it's like, I need, and it's like, I had 500 bucks in a week. Like, okay. It's like, wow. <laughs> yeah. You set the intention. Yeah. It, it kind of was, it was just like, I, I, I and I, it was when I actually needed it too. It wasn't just a want, right. It was, it's like, it's like, I determined, it's like, I need this to do this. And I think, I, I, I think it's highly possible that the universe said, okay, <laughs> and just. <laughs> so did you do the thing where you imagined you already had it? No, 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 nothing no. like that. No, I, I have no idea. I, I don't, I don't follow anything else like that. I don't do any particular, if I do rituals and things like that, I, I do it my own way all the time. I don't, I don't, I don't rely on any, any other you know, prescribed practice or anything like that. It's just, I just, I just said to myself, it's like, okay, this is what I need. And I didn't even think, I didn't think it was going to come through that quickly or anything. I wasn't expecting anything at all. And it was, and all of a sudden it wasn't until I had it that I went, wait a minute. (laughs) 
<laughs> what was that? <laughs> right. What, 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 what did I do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, how did that, it's yeah. like, wait a minute. <laughs> it's like, that was just a week ago. I said I needed that. And here I've got 500 bucks in my hand. What, what, what happened? <laughs> Well, that's great. So do you have any parting words for us, Mark? Oh, I think I've spent myself out. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. That's, that's fine. I want to thank you for being on the podcast. It's a fantastic story. I, I encourage you and I support you in every way of getting your show and getting your message and your story out because it's, it's awesome. It's a great story. Thank you, Rich. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Thank you again for listening. And please leave any comments or suggestions. We're always looking for ways to improve our show and make it the best show it can possibly be. Visit mindfulaccord.com where you can find additional episodes and you can follow our blog. We give some helpful information on mindfulness, meditation, and just ways to manage our everyday stressful lives. And most importantly, if you know of a friend or a family member that would benefit from this story, please share it with them. Until next time, I'm Rich Decker.